Oh, it's so good to be back in Fishers this morning. And if you're watching online on Facebook, I've missed you as well. Uh, and I've been on Facebook with you more on, uh, over the last few weeks. Um, so welcome, welcome. We're glad that you're tuning in. I got to say hi to Brian and Robin in Canada who watch faithfully every single week. Would everybody say hi, Brian and Robin? Would you say one, three, one, two, three? Hi, Brian and Robin. Oh, good, 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 good. Man, I'm so glad that, to be back here in Fishers. And I love being in Pendleton. Some beautiful people over there excited about the church, excited about their Waterline Church. And, and we've been over there, and, and um, I appreciate everybody praying for that, for that church there, that campus there, as they are looking for a new campus pastor and what an adventure that has been. But it's really, we've seen God's hand in it every single day. Um, and God working and moving and providing for them. And Pastor Danielle Freed, my wife, is over there giving leadership. And uh, it's awesome. Yes, yes. He, here's the deal. I've been there for three weeks preaching my guts out and, and leading and teaching. And just like, it's just so exciting over there. And then I came back over here and like we, we, our congregation has grown on Sunday. Like everybody's happy. And I'm like, did you miss me? And you're like, you were gone? Like, things have gotten so much better since you were gone. So we sent Danielle over there, and now I'm back here. And so it's good to be here. Honestly, I love, uh, you know, some of you have been coming to this church for years, and uh, it's just good to see you. It's just good to see you. Good to be with, you know, the church that uh, you kind of grew up with. And so I, I'm glad to be here this morning. We're talking about married people, and this week we have our married people night. And if you have not registered for married people, would you just do it now? I don't know what you're waiting for. Register for this. Maybe you've already registered. Then I'm going to invite you to bring some friends with you and take this. And maybe there's somebody in your life who's finding it difficult to be married. You know who they are. It's like everybody, okay? It's hard to be married. Um, and so we have married people because we want to strengthen marriages. I think the best thing we could do for our community is strengthen marriages. The best thing we could do ever do for our kids is strengthen marriages. The best thing we could ever do for your life is to help you in strengthening your marriage. And we're in a series right now. We're in a brand new series called Soulmates and Roommates. And Pastor Scott Rhino, did he do a good job, Connie, uh, getting us kicked off? <laughs> Boy, sang Elvis. You know what I mean? Like, singing Elvis up here, and uh, it, was, it was awesome. He did such a great job. And then last week, uh, Pastor Jim Bogear, my friend Jim, came, and he spoke, and he's actually speaking right now that exact same message in Pendleton, but he taught us how to fight fair. Isn't that nice to know? And I'm really hoping that you took good notes on that, so this week, when you got into a fight with your spouse, you're like, now, now hang on, now hang on, and you, and you were just trying to, you know, fight Fair. I think there's something powerful about that when God, someone gives you permission and tells you, listen, every relationship has arguments and fights, but they don't have to end as roommates. You can still stay soulmates. And there's something powerful to that, isn't there? And marriage is so difficult. Can I get an amen? amen. Now, you don't, you, don't, you don't have to look at somebody when you say that, okay? Some of you are like, amen, all right? Uh, we get it. Marriage is difficult. It's hard. In the Bible, Paul says how God takes two imperfect people and puts them together is a mystery. Yeah. You no. Know I mean, how do we do this? How is it that we are married to one another? One of the things we've been talking about for the last two weeks, and we're going to talk about this week, is it's not a feeling. Love in our culture says it's a feeling. You can fall into love. You can, like, like you can get out of love, like, you, like it's quicksand or something, like it's mud or something, you know what I mean? Like I don't have the feelings anymore. Like it's not based on that. Scripture tells us that love is not feelings. And it doesn't back it up by saying love's easy, it's going to be great. No, marriage and love is hard. Paul writes about it. It's been commonly called the love chapter. It's kind of where we've been going for this whole series. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you can see the screens beyond my toys, trust me, I have a point for all this stuff here. We got to change some light bulbs this morning. And I felt like during my sermon was the best time. So here's 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 4 through 8. And if you've got your Bibles, pull them out. I want you to follow along on this. And this is what it says. Love is patient. I just felt like there needed to be a long pause after the word patient. I don't know. 
It starts off by saying love is patient. Look, this is how love works. This is how you know what love is. And this series, by the way, soulmates or roommates, this isn't just for marriages. This is for everybody. Any relationship that you are in, this applies. Uh, Yeah, I'm putting a little emphasis on marriage, but this will apply to any relationship that you care about in your life. And Paul says right out of the gate, look, If you're going to have a friendship, if you're going to be in a relationship, if you're going to have kids, if you're going to have a career, if you want to be successful, if you want to be significant, if you want to have anybody else in your life and you don't want to be lonely, love is patient. If you get the rest of it, great. But the very first one out of the gate, you got to get love is patient. And then at the very end of the verse eight, it says that love will last forever. So you better be patient because this ain't going anywhere. Love will, true love will last forever. Well, this is what he says. Love is patient and love is kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Then he goes on. He says, prophecy, which is, be kind of difficult to do. Tell the future, see what God's going to do. God gives you a message, you share that. That's hard stuff right there. Speaking in unknown languages, I barely speak English. I barely passed English, okay? So unknown language is pretty much English for me. It's hard stuff. Speaking unknown languages and a special knowledge, special, like you just know something about something, right? That special knowledge. I don't know how you get to that special knowledge, but just, you've worked hard. You've learned some things. You've put some degrees or certificates under your belt. You know something. Even if you had all of that, which is all hard stuff, it will become useless. But love will last forever. If you're going to dedicate and commit your life to anything, is to love somebody. That's what Paul says. And so we've been unpacking this scripture over the last two weeks, and I'm going to kind of talk about it again this morning. I'm going to give you five ways to be committed, not feeling love, but committed to love in your relationship, committed to love. Here's what I notice about marriage, and I've done a lot of weddings. Uh, I've done a lot of weddings, and I, I can look around the room right now and see all the weddings that I've done. It's kind of romantic for me. Uh, to see. And Jacob and Jenna, you got engaged, huh? Huh? It's going to be awesome, but it's going to be hard. So let me tell you about marriage. Here's what, here's what interesting. Before the wedding, tell me if this is true. Don't yell it out, but think about it. Before the wedding, all the opposites between the two of you, they just attract you. You know what I mean? Like you just like, Oh, I love the way that she, and I love the way that he, and then after the wedding, it's like all those opposites are to attack. You know what I mean? Like, you're the most annoying person in the whole world. First time I met Danielle, uh, we were in college, and we were actually at this place uh, this week. We went up there to visit with a friend, and we were, we were at Indiana Wesleyan University, and there was these two dorms. Uh, one was Bowman House, and one was Shatford House, and one was a Christian guys fraternity kind of uh, created in that way, and then the other one was a Christian girl, and I got moved into the, to the Bowman House, and I got to be with as freshmen, and Danielle was the house president of this Christian sorority girls freshman dorm. She was the house president, and I remember that the leadership of our house, they said, we made breakfast for the girls' house, and, and we're going to serve them breakfast. And I had no idea that what they actually did was, was going to serve them spam and orange drink. It wasn't even orange juice. It was like the most disgusting. They thought they were going to they were gonna surprise them with a disgusting, and, and I'm like, guys, we're trying to make friends at this college, you know, and, and I'd like to meet a girl someday and fall in love, you know, and, and you guys are kind of ruining this for us. Uh, and, but they, they went ahead with it, and, and they woke up all the girls at like five in the morning, and, and they, they all come out of the house, and they're like, you know, what's going on? And, and then I saw this one girl, Danielle. I said, who's she? She looked, she, she's country. She came walking out. You know what I mean? And she watched, she was, all these girls were following her, and, and she was just a leader, and she walked up, and she goes, 
all right, what's going on, right? What's going? She just took charge. Like all these boys now who had prepared this breakfast were like, <laughs> you know, they got all intimidated because you know how boys are with girls. Uh, and she said, what you got for breakfast? And they pulled back the tin foil, and there's all this spam. And, and, and then they had this jug of orange drink, and they thought no girl in their, her right mind would ever drink this. But they didn't know Danielle was from the country, okay? <laughs> and she's like, and she grabbed that Spam, and she grabbed that jug of orange drink, and she ate that Spam, and she junked that, drank that orange drink, and I thought, that's the girl for me. I'm going to marry that girl. It took me two years to get the confidence to finally ask her out on a date. She wouldn't even call it a date. It took me two more years just to trick her to marry me. And we got married on August 9th, 2003, Six years she's been trapped with me and I say trapped with me because before the wedding everything was hunky-dory and then after the wedding it's like the real John Freed showed up and the real John Freed goes to bed early and my wife doesn't I don't know if she sleeps she's not asleep when I go to bed she I don't know that girl stays up all night long. And when we got married, I remember we were living up outside of Milwaukee and it got cold and it got dark at four o'clock and it's like horrible. And so uh, we were up there and, and it was late. And I said, uh, I go, well, it's uh, 930. We should probably start turning in for the night. You know what I mean? Like, when did grandpa show up, right? I think I'm going to have a little vanilla ice cream with peanuts before we go to bed. Like that, I'm like, what? turn in for the night. Who are you? And so she was like depressed, like, you're doing what? I'm going to bed. Tomorrow's a new day. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm afraid of heights, uh, and I'm a, a, afraid of roller coasters. I hate roller coasters. And we went to Six Flags right there outside Chicago, and, and we go to the music park. She wanted to go, and I remember she takes me to this roller coaster. It's like the, like the racer at Kings Island, okay? It's not that big. And she's like, let's ride the roller coasters. I'm like, oh, I didn't tell you. This wasn't in the marriage counseling. I don't do roller coasters. I go to bed early. And my favorite ride at amusement parks is the bench. Okay? That's my favorite ride. That's what everybody should ride. So she's all weepy and, oh, what have I done with my life? All right, I said, I'll ride the roller coaster with you. I'm trying to, you know, give in a little bit. And so I get on the roller coaster. I thought I was going to pass out. It was so scary. Um... And so when I get nervous, I just close my eyes, and, uh, and I just kind of relax my body, just trying to get through it, you know? And so I'm going tick, 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 tick. And she's like, no, you're, you're supposed to raise your hand like, ah. I'm like, nope, we actually, we just try to make it through. You know what I mean? Just, just get through it. And so she starts crying. She's like, are you going to pass out? I was like, this is what I do. This is what. She's like, are you okay? I'm fine. This is our marriage now. This is what, this is what you got. And so rather than like, ah, everybody else in the roller goes like, this is so much fun. And little five-year-olds are like, yeah. And then there's Danielle who's like, huh. And me, huh. It was depressing marrying me, really, honestly. Um, and thank God it's not based on feelings, but it's based on commitment. Thank God that Danielle realized that. I was a child when we got married, and uh, I was very selfish. Here's what marriage in our culture is like. Marriage in our culture is difficult because it's kind of like hula hooping, right? I, I, let me just say this. Let me just say this. I understand that the scariest things in America right now the number one scariest thing in America is speaking in public. And I just need you to know that I'm not scared to speak in public. Uh, I have a problem with not speaking in public. And, uh, uh, but my scariest thing, number one, is hula hooping in public. I don't know if you've done that recently, but I'm going to do that for you just to show you how awkward it is. And I came in and my hula hoop is broke. How am I supposed to perform with this? Here's what I noticed about marriage. I noticed about marriage is that we all have a marriage that's a circle. And I think the ring is great. I think the ring is great. Represents commitment, right? Never ending. But here's the problem with a circle marriage. A circle marriage says that the whole universe is all about me. I'm at the center of everything. There's this selfishness that we are all born selfish. Do you realize that? And depending on what year you were born or what generation you come from, 
It is a growing concern, honestly, the selfishness and the self-focus of all our of people in our culture that, I mean, literally, children wake up and the name is printed on their wall, you know what I mean, like embroidered on their bag, like it's all about them. And then when you get married, it's not about you anymore. You wake up every day of your life going, what am I going to do today? What, are, what am I going to want? What, am, what do I want in love? And all these expectations and all these different things, it's like hula hooping. You know what the second greatest fear of hula hooping in public is? Watching me hula hoop in public. Hula hooping is very difficult. It's kind of a one-man thing. It's a circle. Imagine if I had Danielle here. Don't imagine it too much. But imagine if I had Danielle here and I said, Danielle, we're going to get married. It's going to be awesome. And, and look, this is how it goes to be married to me. Hop in. Get, and then we try to get in sync and try to, you know, be together, try to hula hoop together. It's just weird and awkward. And then you're like, we can't hula hoop together. And you go to friends, you go, why can't he get it together? Why can't she get it together? If she would just do like me, think like me, act like me, she just might be the next best thing. (laughs) Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We live in a circle kind of marriage. And Paul says, no, 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 you got it all wrong. Love is patient and kind. And look what he says here. Can we pull that scripture back up? This is what he said. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. Here's how, here's how he says. He gives us five ways. I'm going to write, you write these down. I got to follow a long guide in your uh, next steps folder. Pull it out. Pull this out because I am not getting blamed for your marriage, okay? I'm not getting blamed for that. No way. I'm going to give you five things today to stay committed in your marriage that Paul gives us. I'm going to pull them out of this scripture right here. Paul gives us five things that when the feelings wear off, the commitment kicks in and marriage begins. And marriage becomes such a life-giving holiness thing, a thing that God could use in such a beautiful thing. The very first thing I want you to write down is this. Number one, stop being selfish. Stop being selfish. He says in verse four, love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. The number one problem of marriage is people. If we could just eliminate that factor in the marriage, this would be awesome. The problem is, the problem is two imperfect people come together. And if we're not depending on God and staying focused on God and taking the focus every day off ourselves and putting it on God, then we live circle lives. I drew it like this. You can draw this in your notes. When we put God as the focal point and I'm down here and Danielle's over here and I'll just tell you right now, Danielle and I are a lot alike. Our personalities are a lot alike. We think a lot alike. We have a lot of the same strengths, but we are completely different people. She's fun. I'm a humbug. She's nice. I'm not. And so there's... (laughs) There's, there's these two different people. And if I look to her and say, okay, how am I going to be married to hear her? How am I going to make this work? It is a selfish thought. It's a selfish mindset. How am I going to hula hoop? How am I going to live this circle life with her? And what, God, what Paul is saying here, he said, if you focus on God and you, you both are, are watching him, This is what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. It says, you must have the the same attitude. Everyone say attitude. Attitude. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. He released it. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges over and over and over and over again throughout his entire earthly ministry, he constantly gave up those privileges that he had as being 100% God out of love. 
That's commitment. And he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died even a criminal's death on the cross. Here's how a ladder works. Here's how the triangle marriage works. To get away from the circle, you have to move towards this. What happens is we have Danielle and we have John. And when we, when we lean in on who God is, you, you see in this, when we, when we lean in on who Christ is and we take on and we focus on who Christ is, and we live our lives to be like Christ, changing our attitudes, changing our intentions. What happens is, over time, it draws us closer together. Because what we have in common is our love for Christ and our chasing Jesus Christ and following him. That's what draws us together and allows us to stay committed to each other. Are you getting this? Because, because when it's humbled, meaning it's leaning on each other, our strength in our marriage is that when two people who are so different mysteriously humble themselves, what if, what if we thought about that? What if in the John and Danielle world, if what we fought about every day was how we could serve one another? Uh, we fought about how, who is going to serve the other one more. And, who, and, and we woke up every day going, all right, Lord, I have breath in my lungs and I'm here today to serve that woman. What will you have me do? How can I serve that person? And then, and then Danielle wakes up because I always wake up first because I'm going to bed first. And so Danielle would wake up and she would just say, Lord, how can I serve John today? And then there's this mad rush to make the other person coffee in the morning. You know what I mean? Like there's this mad rush to go, no, 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 you stay in bed. Let me get the kids up and off to school. No, 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 no. Let me do this for you. And there's this but what is it that we do fight about? That you didn't act like me, talk like me, walk like me, do like me? What do we fight about? What was the last fight you had about? And this selfish thing is so real. Right, here's the second thing. Here's the second thing. Stop lying to each other. Paul says, it does not rejoice, this is what love does, it does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Stop lying to each other. Stop lying to each other. A lot of times it's hard for people to draw closer to one another because the foundation of their relationship is not based on trust. It's based on lies, keeping the peace, saying what they want to hear, keeping little things hidden in the back. See, the foundation to a marriage has always and will forever be and only work if it's trust. Stop lying to each other. And so oftentimes in marriages, we don't, we don't tell each other the truth. We're afraid to tell each other the truth. We're, we're afraid to... Listen, listen, the truth stings. I know that. It stings when Danielle tells me the truth. It stings me even to tell Danielle the truth. But lying stabs, and if you've ever been lied to by a spouse, you know how deep and how hurtful that is. Trust has got to be that foundation for a relationship. Paul says, it does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices when the truth wins out. When the truth <coughs> wins out. He says, Number one, stop being selfish. And then number two, stop lying to each other. Stop being selfish. Stop lying to each other. Stop being selfish. Stop lying to each other. And, and then he goes on, he says, now do this. Now do this. I like this. Now do this. Here, here's three things to do. Three things to do. Number one, number three, start protecting each other. Start protecting each other. He says in verse seven, love never gives up. And love never loses faith. That's how we know it's love. Start protecting each other. You say, John, how do you protect each other? As a husband, I always want to protect my wife. And one of the ways that we protect one another 
is by understanding and verbalizing and speaking, constantly reminding the rules of the relationship. Now, every relationship has rules. If you don't believe me, go home and do something you know your spouse doesn't like. That's a rule broken, okay? Uh, there is a rule in relationships. How do we have relationships outside of our relationship? How are we friends with these people? How are we communicating to these people? What's okay? What's not okay? How are we having a relationship with the opposite sex? How are we having a relationship with your boys, with your girls? What conversations are we allowed to have with them and not allowed to have? There are all these rules to the relationship and it starts with relationship. There are rules to that. And when those rules get broken, your relationship, oh, here's the one, family, okay? Mother-in-law, father-in-law, it all, oh, it's a whole nother mix. We can go into that, right? Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> There's rules in the relationship. The second thing is, the second thing is, is uh, routines. There's rules to the routines. Like when I told Danielle, I'm going to bed, it's 9.30, she, that's a routine that she was not expecting, and there's rules to this. My wife has a little sign uh, on the back of the kitchen uh, wall, and it, and it says, hugs and kisses I love, but I, what I really love is when you do the dishes. It says something like that. I just know to do the dishes, okay? It rhymes. <laughs> I just know that if I come in and I'm like, hey, baby, it's been a long day. Give me a big smooch. She's going to be like, how about you do the dishes? I've learned this over 16 years. Now I know. I come home and go, hey, baby, it's been a long day. Can I do the dishes for you? <gasps> she loves it. It's like a trick. She loves it because I know the rules. When I know the rules of the routine, I can win at the game of marriage. There's rules. There's rules. Love never gives up, and it never loses faith. There's rules in the routine. And the final one is there's rules in the responsibility, knowing my role and that she can trust me. Knowing my role and that she can trust me. Understanding what, what I bring to the relationship and what she brings to the relationship. And we focus on God to define that. See, he's the one thing that we have in common. And all of the rules are based on him. And as her relationship with him grows, our relationship can grow. And as my relationship grows with Christ, my relationship with Danielle can grow. When my relationship with Christ is not growing, my relationship with Danielle is hindered, is failing, is broken down. Number four, start having hope for each other. Verse seven says, love never gives up, it never loses faith, and is always hopeful. I find this one interesting because so oftentimes in relationships, when you get into the marriage, all of a sudden, this hero becomes a zero. And you start identifying faults and mistakes, and, and they're just repeated over and over, and the rules are getting broken, and they're selfish, and you see all their selfishness, and you don't really see your own selfishness. And it loses hope. But you need to start having hope for each other. And one of the ways to do that, just a simple way, is words. When you speak words to each other, you know, I find this interesting that, like I said before, the wedding, all the opposites before the wedding attract us, but after the wedding, it's like all the opposites attack. I find this interesting. And tell me what you think. I think there's one person in the relationship who becomes the picker. They're just picking up all the problems and they're pointing out all the problems. They just pick, 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 and they're bringing it up all the time. Why don't you do this? Why don't you do this? And why don't you do this? Pick, 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 pick. There's always the picker in the relationship. And then the other one is usually the pusher. Eh, eh, I don't want to talk. And they're just, they're just, eh. And, and the one pick, 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 and a pu uh, uh, pick, 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 uh, 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 pick, 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 pick. You getting this? There's pickers and there's pushers. And it creates distance. And quickly soulmates become roommates. But when you start speaking words of life and pointing out where the other person is a hero, there's this incredible quote, Howard Hendricks. 
incredible teacher on marriage. He says, most divorces happen over 10% of what's wrong and they can't see the 90% that's actually pretty good. Because somebody's picking and somebody's pushing, but who is pointing and saying things like, I see in you. See, when Danielle does that for me, the most powerful letters in a leader's alphabet is I see in you. When Danielle starts speaking those kind of words to, to me, I go from zero to hero. See, I walk off this stage today and you'll say, great sermon, John. Good, you didn't cuss. Good job. You know what I mean? Great job. We're happy. And I love it. I appreciate it. It's a compliment. I really do a thing. I appreciate that. But when my wife says, John, that was a good sermon, And when my wife said, when I came to her and said, I just feel like God's calling us to start a church. And she goes, I always knew you'd do that. I went from zero to hero. I don't know what conversations you have or what thoughts you have if your spouse is going from hero to zero all the time. Are they going from hero to zero with your children? Are they going to hero to zero in the conversations, the way that you look? But if they could go from zero to to hero because of you never loses hope it always is hopeful here's the last one write this down start a love that can't be stopped start a love that can't be stopped it says love never gives up never loses faith is always hopeful and endures through every circumstances endures through every circumstances I've been married for 16 years and one of my favorite questions to ask people who've been married longer than me, if you've been married 20 years, if you've been married 25 years, 30 years, 40 years, I always want to know, so what is it? What is it that, that made it work? What is it that, that went the long haul? Hey man, tell me how you tricked her to stay with you for 60 years, right? Like, like how did that work? And, and every time, every time, they said it's because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Every time, our relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, I'd say, yeah, yeah, but there's got to be more. Uh, no, 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 no. You don't understand. There's been, there's been good times, and then there's been bad times. And there's been times where she couldn't even look at me because of who I had become and how I had changed But then there were times where we just both looked at Christ and we were going towards Christ and we saw each other from across the room and we connected and there was a love there that was so much deeper and so much greater and it endured through the good times and the bad times. That a relationship in a marriage is the most mysterious thing, Paul says. Oh, we can't figure it out. But what happens is when you focus on Christ, he draws you closer together. I don't know where you're at in your relationship this morning. I don't know where you're at in your marriage. But is it enduring? I love hearing about relationships that endure. Endure through the hard times. There was a time in Danielle and I's life. Some of you lived through it with us. When Danielle was really sick, I remember taking her to Chicago and seeing the surgeon there who had been trained at the Mayo Clinic and hearing what he was going to do to to help my wife survive, help my wife live. And I remember sitting there watching Danielle as she's hearing about the surgery. And then then I remember showing up for the surgery. See, we we got a Chicago toll pass in our van. It's a, it's a war wound. It's not a, it reminds us of going to there. And I remember when uh, she came out of surgery and how much pain she was in. I couldn't believe this was outpatient. And how I had to take her now back to the Holiday Inn Express and somehow keep her comfortable. And I don't even know where the CVS in Chicago was. And I had to somehow help her even do the simplest of things. But it's in those moments where love endured. It wasn't feeling. It's called commitment. 
and this woman who is committed to me to let me go to bed early, we were committed to endure. I don't have a lot more time with you this morning. But that kind of love, it points me to only to Christ's love for us. This moment right here. When Jesus did this action, this sacred action, we call it a sacrament, called communion. Christians have been celebrating this and practicing this and doing this thousands of years. Where Jesus took the bread with his disciples and he said, this is what love looks like. I'm going to be broken for you. Broken for you. Take and eat. And as you take me in, you'll become whole. You'll become right. Now all those broken things will be made right, redeemed. And he said, I want you to take the wine, or in our case, juice. And just as the, the, the juice runs, the grapes are crushed. So my blood will wash away sins. And no matter what happened before this moment right here, you are forgiven. Never forget this. This is love. And so oftentimes at Waterline, we take communion. It's an open table. We just ask that one thing happens. You are honest with God. That you would check your heart and say, is this true? Do I truly want this new life? Do I truly want to be made new? Do I truly want to have my sins forgiven? To repent of those things? To move away from those things? And say, God, I want to start new today for you. For some of you, it may be the very first time you take communion. This is your moment of salvation. This is your moment of new life. This is your moment of commitment. To step into his moment of commitment. And for some of you, you've taken communion many times. And this is your moment of commitment. Enduring love. Would you stand with me today?